Connecting the dots in the beauty industry, Kelly Kovac is the founder and CEO of Beauty Matter, a hub for curated industry news and content and a consulting agency. So stay tuned as we discuss her incredible career from beauty startups to empires. Hi everyone and welcome to Founded Beauty, a podcast dedicated to beauty entrepreneurs who built some of the biggest brands today and where we learn exactly how they did it. We'll cover some of the most intimate stories that are path to success and how they overcame the obstacles along the way. I'm Akash Mehta, CEO and co-founder of Fable & Main, a modern hair wellness brand inspired by ancient Indian beauty secrets. Building Fable & Main has been an incredible journey so far, and I decided to launch this podcast as a founder keen to learn and connect with fellow beauty brand founders around the world. I believe in collaboration over competition, and so I'm using this platform as a way to hopefully help and inspire each other in what can be quite a tough and lonely journey. So if you are an entrepreneur or simply just curious how to build a brand, this podcast is perfect for you. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today, Kelly Kovac. She is the industry maverick behind Beauty Matter, offering an unfiltered yet informed perspective on the beauty industry. As founder and CEO, Kelly has gathered her 25 plus years in consulting, advising and scaling businesses to identify the blank spaces and emerging trends that benefit both experts and novices. Simply put, Kelly has shaped how we all approach beauty and as a member of the first executive team at Bliss, Kelly broke all the rules and began a beauty catalogue which was unheard of at that time. Fast forward to today, where catalogues have evolved into online retail and Kelly's innovative method of hybridizing with other industries has become best practice. Now also a podcast host herself and popular speaker at Global Beauty Conferences, Kelly truly is a trailblazer and I cannot wait for our conversation today. So Kelly, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me, Akash. It's nice to be on the other side of the podcast equation. Uh, so everyone who's listening in, me and Kelly, we actually know, now known each other for a while now. And every time I meet you, I just get this like, like such a good energy and vibe. You're truly in the industry. Not only are you so well respected and rightly so, but my personal experiences with you have been anything shy but of incredible. So just want to preface that by saying it is personally such a honor to have you here in the podcast. So thank you for making the time. That's very kind. Thank you. So I asked all my guests the same question. I'm going to ask you, who okay. in a nutshell is Kelly? Wow. Um, you know, I think, I think Kelly is sort of a work in progress. Um, you know, I, my career has been anything but linear. If you look at it sort of on a piece of paper, you sort of are like, how on earth did, did this kind of come to be? Um, and I think the connective tissue is really just the sense of curiosity um, and really just trying to move from one opportunity to another. Um, and not being afraid to take risks. So I have sort of reinvented myself a number of times. Um, so yeah, I really just think it's sort of a work in progress. The industry is always moving, so you kind of have to move with it. Amazing. Yeah, it's so, so true. And beautifully said. I, I kind of want to go back to the... Is it, where were you born and raised, actually? I wanted to know. So I was born in Montreal, Canada. So most people don't know. I, I guess I'm Canadian by birth. Um, but I grew up in Florida. Um, went to school in Washington, D.C. I thought I, I studied politics and philosophy, thought I wanted to um, go to law school, um, and ended up in retail and then ended up in beauty. After school, I moved to New York. So I've been here for about 30 years. Wow. Okay. So... At the beginning, so you were born and raised in Florida. Do you, do you have any like early memories of beauty growing up as a, as a child? No, you know, I'm not one of those girls who sort of saved up their allowance to go buy lip gloss. Uh -huh. I was I was a huge tomboy. Um, I played sports, you know, um, all through high school. Um, and I also went to a Catholic school my entire life. So makeup was like a no go. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think my early experiences really sort of came from my grandmother. 
Um, her nails were always painted. She had one tube of lipstick that she'd put on her lips. Then she would kind of blot it with um, a tissue and then use it as rouge. Um, and she was always, always um, just sort of done. My mother was not like that, much more natural. So I think, you know, she's sort of my first kind of, I guess, experience with, with beauty um, in kind of a formalized way. Oh, so you moved to New York and I know you've had an incredible career. I mean, I don't even know where to start. So, I mean, just tell us a little bit about your move to New York and then maybe your first few, uh, I guess, opportunities in the beauty industry that you kind of started to build in your career. Yeah, sure. I mean, I sort of, I ended up in beauty by, it was pure accident. Um, yeah. So I moved to New York um, after a couple years after um graduating college. Uh, I was, while in school, unbeknownst to my parents, I had took a full-time job because I wasn't really interested in school. Mm. So I was running three Benetton stores in a, as an assistant manager. Benetton was, it was sort of the heyday of Benetton. Um, and so after I graduated, I was like, they, they had been offering me um, a job all while I was in school. Um, so I just went and worked with them to open new stores. Um, my parents were not thrilled after having invested all that money. And as they said, I was folding sweaters. Um, but I was in retail um, and then decided I wanted to move to New York. Um, so got a job at Bergdorf Goodman in the men's store, um, sort of a seasonal help. Um, and then ended up in the, the supply side of the fashion industry. Um, and it was one of those situations where I wasn't very happy. It was difficult to get a job for a number of reasons. Um, and I, a friend of mine was going to run the, this spa. Um, and the spa is what we now know as Bliss. Um, and he said, you know, I need someone to answer the phones. You're not going to get a job during the summer anyway, so just come and answer the phones for a few month, months while we launch. So I said yes. Um, Marcia uh, asked what I did. I was running supply um, sales and, and production for a leather supplier, um, and she said, well, she can run our catalog. So Marcia wanted to do a catalog. Um, none of us really knew what we were doing. I said yes, um, and her apartment was two blocks from my apartment in the East Village, and that's where the Bliss catalog was born, and that's how I got into the beauty industry. That's amazing. So your your career in the beauty industry has been quite phenomenal. I, I mean, from Dr. Dennis Gross to the, all the other... Tell us a bit about kind of, again, like... It's going to be hard to summarize, so we could do a whole podcast on your career. But generally speaking, <laughs> if you are going to summarize it, it would be tell very us. boring. But yes, I suppose we could. It would not be boring. But I mean, to yourself, because you've done it. But for us, I'm like, whoa, this is so like inspirational. This is so cool. But yeah, go go for it. Yeah. So you know, I think for me, um, bliss was where it was really the light bulb moment of my career, where you know I didn't realize. So this was. In 1996, yeah, yeah. Bliss launched in 19, March 1996, um, and it had never occurred to me, and this, so this was also just, you know, for the younger people listening, this was before sort of online um, e-commerce or even real websites existed. Um, so it was very much sort of a print world. Um, but beauty, you know, the beauty industry did not sell through catalogs. So this yeah. was a, a, a period where Marcia is this really charismatic, visionary marketer. We were, um, Michael, who was my friend that got me there, we were all round about the same age, all lived downtown New York. So it was one of these things where it was right time, right place. We all sort of got it, right? Yeah. Um, and it's when I realized that you could be creative and run a business, and that I was like, okay, I'm I'm good at this. I didn't even know this existed, and that sort of kickstarted it. Um, I stayed until the sale to LVMH in '99, and then um, sort of went on to have various incarnations of um, advisory businesses in different shapes and forms, um, working with sort of startups, cleanups. Um, 
some some of the big beauty brands, some fashion brands. Started a couple um, brands along the way. So I uh, partnered with G Beck from Rescue Beauty Lounge, a business yeah. that doesn't exist anymore, but she really um, kind of revolutionized in New York the idea of getting nail services. And I was a client, and then we launched um, – nail products. And this was a sort of when nail lacquer was not sold on shelves. It was on in dusty baskets um, under the counter. Yeah. Um, you know, I've also launched an uh, indie fragrance brand called Odin um, in, in uh, 15 Very years cool. ago. Um, but, you know, I think, and it's interesting because from the outside looking in these brands were much bigger. They looked much bigger than they were. There was an opportunity um, to, to exit that in both of them that didn't happen for various reasons. Um, and most people sort of in today's construct of exits or raising money being the, the sign of success, I suppose they would were failures. But I never mm. really... I never really looked at them that way. They were sort of a path along the way. And, yeah, they were disappointing when what I had envisioned didn't really come to fruition. But still remain proud of what we had built. Um, And sort of looking back, you know, all those experiences kind of give me the unique perspective I have. You know, in the middle of launching those two brands, I was also um, the uh, part of the original – sort of team uh, for Dr. Dennis Gross, sort of taking his product out of his office um, and, and kind of formalizing it in a business, helped him launch his book, launch his practice, kind of restage the brand. Um, come full circle, I serve on their board, so it's very cool to, to sort of um, have that experience. Um, And, yeah, I mean, that kind of takes us sort of short term. I mean, I've had four consulting agencies with with different partners, um, but started focusing on Beauty Matter, kind of building a business um, on Mm. the idea um, about three years ago. That's amazing. I I do want to talk a little bit about that because I think the impact of your, you know, your, uh, I guess, like your reputation and what work you do can really you know, it's not like when you finish a job, it finishes there. And I, I know you were um, looking at like, sort of at your LinkedIn. Uh, you were at mm-hmm. Dr. Dennis Gross until 2006, I believe, right? As, a, mm-hmm. as in like working there. Yeah. But then is it, was it in 2020 you started at a board position there? Um, I don't know if this is correct. It or, wa- or yes, it was, um, it was when Carrie and Dennis took their first outside investment. So it was 2020. Amazing, 2020. And that's really cool to be like, you know, your, you know, things can come back later in different forms. So your, what the impact you make wherever you are and anyone listening, whether you're in a company today, you never know, you know, you might work there again, you might be affiliated with them again. So, you know, definitely strive to always make the best Im- impression wherever you are. I think it's very important. And did you envision when you left Dr. Dennis Gross in 2006 that you'd be on the board today? No, I'm no, not at all. You know, I, yeah. I, I guess, you know, what I've realized um, through my career, well, it took me a while to realize this, but I'm not an operator. Um, mm. I can play an operator, but there are people that are way better at it. I'm very good at um, when there's a problem fixing it or finding white space and defining it. Um, But once things are sort of on their way um, and they're sort of a North Star and a team that's working towards it, there are people better suited to to build the business. Um, And, you know, when I left – actually, when I left um, Dr. Dennis Gross, I was also sort of unwinding um, my partnership with Rescue Beauty. And I stepped away from the beauty industry. Um, I was kind of – I'm like, I'm I'm just – I'm done. Um, just because I felt like I felt like I was doing the same thing over and over again, um, yeah. and I went into the hospitality business for a year. Um, but I realized that I was um, more interested on the other end of the hospitality business as a guest, <laughs> and um, and it really made me appreciate the beauty industry and the knowledge I had. Um, mm. With a respect, I'm not sure I had when I stepped away. That's amazing. No, thanks for sharing that. I think it's very, uh, again, we can learn so much from you. But I think the most exciting thing now to learn from is how you created Beauty Matter. Because for me, 
it's one of my, uh, I, I read it reg- daily, if not regularly. I try to read it daily, but I have to be sometimes <laughs> um, but, but I love the roundups you do on your emails because that's how I'm like, oh my God. And then I, and I go back to reading what I missed, you know. Um, but what you've created, this whole, I guess, um, universe from uh, whether it's the reports to the, the, the news articles to the podcast, it's incredible. But we'd love to know how it all began and first and foremost, how you came up with the name Beauty Matter. So, you know, I think it's it's sort of how I've started all of my businesses. Well, this actually, this is the first business um, that I have launched by myself That's and so, yeah. that I've been the face of. So yeah. my entire career, I've had partners, um, even though there are people in the industry who are like, when are you just going to do your own thing, Kelly? Like, this is crazy. <laughs> I guess I'm a very slow learner. Um <laughs> But, you know, I I felt the, the story I told myself was that I was very collaborative and I liked working with teams um, and that's why I had partners. I think in hindsight, it, there was an insecurity there. It was easier to do it with someone else, um, even if, you know, even if it it didn't, you know, I think I think relationships evolve. Um, Mm. And people grow. So just because, you know, um, a partnership didn't work, you know, I kind of chalk it up to um, the brands I built as well. It was sort of a period of time where we did something cool and then you sort of you move on. Um, But at some point during. um, It was when I owned Purpose Built, we started building brands differently and we started, Mm. I started thinking of them as content platforms. So instead of building a really nice brand story, I deconstruct the brand story and think of, you know, how these different elements could be, um, could be activated for content. So this was about 15 years ago where people weren't really thinking about it that way. Um, And it made me... People also were asking me to to write, and I'm not a natural writer. It would take me two days to write 500 words. It was so painful. Um, but I did it because I had to market the business. And I don't know, maybe I think it's because I don't have a filter. <laughs> so people sort of resonated, I guess, with the honesty of some of what I was writing. And it's and I also – this was around when Business of Fashion launched as well, the really early stages of it. And I thought what – Emron was doing was so fresh. And I was like, why does nothing like this exist in the beauty industry? Um, You know, and this was before kind of beauty independent Vogue business, um, business of fashion was only covering fashion, um, glossy, you know, the, the B2B space has evolved a lot, but there was nothing then. And I just couldn't get out of my head, like, why couldn't beauty do have a B2B trade that was sort of visually interesting, covered the entire ecosystem. And it rattled around in my head for about five years because I know how to put goop in a jar and sell it. I, I don't know anything about media. Um, I didn't know mm. how much it would cost. I didn't even know where to start. I just had this idea that I couldn't shake. Um, and, you know, sometimes the universe puts opportunities in front of you. And two people came out of a big ad agency um, and wanted to work with me. Uh, I said yes, because I needed their skills, but with the caveat that they had to help me build this. Um, And, you know, the name, I don't even really know where it came from. I think it was, you know, it's really hard to name brands now because you have to get the URL and the trademarks Trademark and, and it's it's yeah. gotten much more complicated. So it was kind of this brainstorming um, and we did have to do some, you know, I, I think we had to buy someone out or something, but it was nominal. Um, but yeah, it was, the name wasn't clear in my mind, but when it was available, it became clear. And I really launched it. I had no way of quantifying there was a business yeah. here. I just, in my gut, I knew. Um, but we launched with a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is there's a business here. Um, don't know what it is, but I think there's a business here. Um, and plan B is no one really cares, but we still need to market ourselves. So we'll use it as a marketing vehicle. Mm. 
And we went out and built it and started as sort of just curating content or aggregating content. And I would ask people, you know, what they thought of the idea and kind of spent about a year building it. And John Caffarelli, who's our COO now, was a client who became a friend. And I had breakfast with him. And he's like, when are you going to launch this thing? Just like stop talking about it already. And I was like, oh, it's not quite ready. And he told me, he's like, it's Tech Kelly. You have to launch with an ugly baby. And I was like, yeah, but we've met. I really do ugly babies. So, um, And you know, listen, this was at a later stage in my career. So I didn't feel like I had... And maybe this is just my type A. I didn't have the luxury of failing. Like if I was going to do this, it had to be intentional. And six weeks later, we launched it. I listened to him. And we just launched it without a plan and a newsletter. And I was working with Old Navy at the time. I was on site there. I came back to the, um, the hotel and my inbox had exploded. And I was like, okay, so I was right. But now what do I do? I, I literally now didn't I have a plan it. for it. So that is how Beauty Matter came to be. That's sometimes the best way. And I think it's kind of like led with instinct, but also with community. Like as you build it and more and more people reach out to you, you yeah. can see what people are looking for and what people want. And, and I think it's very important, even if you have an incredible career, is to think about, okay, but well, we're now in whatever, 2020 and 2021, 2022. Every year is different. And like... It's like, I can tell you, like, I used to be a social media whiz, expert, I used to be going to mm-hmm. do all these talks. Now I'm like, I'm not qualified. Like, I don't know what it is today as it was last year. And I think when you build something built on agility and community and not necessarily so thinking about this is what I know, this is what I should do, this is the business plan for three years. I think, you know, that's today we have to build it that way. So I think yeah. you built it in the perfect. So I would love to know a little bit, like, how did it, like, what came first and like eventually now what it is you know I know recently yeah. events and awards but what was what was how did it start yeah so when I realized that um you know a lot of people reached out and wrote very kind emails people who are very busy and have better things to do than write me a long emails and you know I went through a period of are people being nice or is there something really here and mm. And what is that? Why are they making the comparisons they're making? Um, And I was really, really busy in my advisory work. And we were Mm. kind of, um, you know, kind of in the middle of a growth spurt for Odin's. I didn't really have time to focus on on beauty matter. And I – People were gonna, were asking me, are you going to raise money? I'm like, against what? Like, I don't even really know what I'm building here. So I did yeah. it on the side um, for three years. We, we sent out three emails a week, 18 pieces of content for three years with no pressure of the business making any money. Um, and I think in hindsight that – I mean, it's not – it's a luxury that most people don't have when building a business. But yeah. um, I was fortunate enough to – you know, and it was also helping um, the consulting business as well. I think people yeah. in the industry were like, what is she doing over there? But I was figuring things out. Um, and, you know, we evolved the platform. So it started as just aggregated content. Um, I yeah. found that I read a lot more more than most people and different sources than a lot of people were reading. So aggregated the content. Then it, we'd start doing some of our, our own. Um, we were always doing sort of the deal flow. So the deal yeah. flow that's turned into the M&A report was something I was doing even pre-Beauty Matter um, as, a, as a marketing thing. Um, yeah. And slowly we evolved it. Um, I'd get interns, we'd write. um, And I knew that at some point I would focus on the business. I didn't, I didn't really know when. Um, And I had a really large consulting project that ended. um, And that was about three years ago. Um, And John had, had, was the COO of Paper Magazine, and they had just exited Paper. Um, So the timing was good. So I went and asked him, again, 
do you want to do this thing with me with a four page PowerPoint of what my what my vision was? Um, and he said, I'll give you six months. Let's see. Um, and that's when we really started building a business on top of sort of this this community and and brand. Um, mm. You know, I was comparing our our sort of um, our traffic and, and engagement against you know business of fashion and women's wear because those were our competitors, and so we paled yeah. in comparison. But I didn't realize. Um, that the numbers for purely sort of organic traffic were quite high. And so once I, I realized that, I was like, there is really a business um, to be built. And to this point, it still has been totally organic. We haven't spent a dime on acquiring um, yeah. users or anything. Um, so, yes, it, it sort of, um, you know, we've slowly – business vertical by business vertical proved out um, sort of business thesis, business theses um, and revenue models. So first was I had to tell people it was no longer free. <laughs> yeah. um, we had a switch to subscription, which was painful. Yeah. Um, we also started – at one point, the, the M&A reports were free as well. We had to start charging for those. So, yeah. you know, you have to break – you have to break that habit of it being free. Um, and I, I, you know, when people would complain, I would just kind of joke about it. I'm like, I'm, I'm not running a nonprofit. Like, I've got bills yeah. to pay like everyone else. Um, and then we started doing what we call marketing services. So, um, you know, John and I have been owners, operators, investors. So that's our secret sauce. That's our vision through which we do everything. Um, and we're hyper-focused on delivering value. So, um, you know, we have a lot of really deep relationships. So advertising. Um, and then just this year we launched, we did our first event in L.A., which you yeah. traveled to, which was amazing. I mean, um, and awards. So that's kind of up to speed where we are today. Those are kind of the business verticals. And I, and I, and I don't say this lightly, and it was definitely, if not the best, like beauty event I've been to, like Summit. And, and the fact that it was your first is, is, is incredible. Uh, but it was uh, so like, it kind of like, and I think I heard you say this, and, and I'll rather you say it as well than me tell it from your own um, words. But generally speaking, it was like this kind of like, deconstructed you know you've been to hundreds of events in the past and you knew what were the pain points but also what people enjoyed and personally I've been to many and I love the fact that it had like these breakout areas you can mingle you can network you had uh, different rooms but they were kind of glass so you could still see through them like it was and it was beautifully designed the logo the market but tell us about the event from your from your yeah. creative vision so pre-COVID, um, we were going – we were going to – we had events planned. They were sponsored. They were mm -hmm. completely different. So I, mm -hmm. we always knew we wanted to do events. Um, you know, I think how – I guess it's what I've always done in, in, in my career. It's like, you know, it, it's very easy to do what everyone else does, but yeah. it doesn't mean it works and it doesn't mean it can't be done a different way. It just – I mean – I will tell you it would have been easier just to do it the way everyone else does it. But sure. we, yeah, I mean, we went and literally deconstructed the event. So where are the pain points? Waiting for badges. We didn't want anyone waiting for badges. Getting coffee or having a cocktail, right? So I had to argue with our event planner to have two bars because she was like, you don't need it for 250 people. I was like, wait, but I want it. <laughs> so um, I didn't want people waiting. Um, you know, the food, like why does the food have to be bad? Why can't it be amazing food? So we partnered yeah. with Squirrel in L.A. and we did these amazing sort of box lunches and, and breakfast. Um, you know, we had all these plans to donate the extra food because on these things there's always a lot of food left. We had the other problem. We had a call. You didn't know this, Akash, but in the middle of the – I didn't know it either actually. We had a call and have them deliver more food. Really? Yeah. <laughs> because it was that good. That's why. It was yeah. so yummy. I remember. Yeah. And so then, good. you know, we also thought, well, you have to feed people um, yeah. throughout the day. So why do we have to have, like, bags of chips and whatever? And we built the, the pop-up market, um, the next market. And, you know, there's always been this adjacency with food and beverage. Um, so yeah. we reached out to f um, startup food and beverage um, companies and said, hey, we're doing this market. 
um, you know, and people send us five cases of this, seven cases of that. And so we um, stocked the market. Um, and that was kind of our version of a goodie bag. It was just sort of like, go take what you want, drink through, you know, eat, drink throughout the day. Um, you yeah. know, it got noisy towards the end of the day. It's because people found the tequila in the refrigerator. <laughs> I saw it. It was that. <laughs> um, but first and foremost, it was really about community and creating a space that didn't feel like a trade show. So even though we had vendors there, they were integrated into the space. Um, you know, kind of, it felt, I guess, sort of like um, a hotel lobby. So our sponsors yeah. got a seating area with two iPads um, and a sign that we designed. Um, and I have to, I honestly, I have to I was so grateful to all of our sponsors because we had no point of reference. We had all these yeah. crazy ideas. There were moments where we were like, we didn't even know if we were going to be able to pull it off. Yeah. But they trusted us. Um, so, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do it without them. You yeah. know, we had a playlist. We just – and, you know, we also – like you said, there are a lot of conferences and people have – are really busy, budgets are limited, so we never take it for granted when people spend yeah. their time or their money with us. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've gone to these long enough where, you know, I'm usually the person in the corner on the phone because I don't know anyone, I'm pretending I'm working. And yeah. we didn't want any of that. At all of our events, they're highly staffed, so we had 18 people there. Um, and their job is not only to sort of make it run smoothly, but if they see someone s sitting, standing by themselves, we try and engage people. And we want people to know that if you come to our events, you can come by yourself and you're going to have a good time. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, I did that and I had a great time and I met <laughs> a lot of people. And it was, it was exactly that where you have this opportunity to go to different talks, but at the same time, you can also network a bit and, 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 you know, do as you please. It was very free, but very inviting, I felt. And I think, uh, yeah, you said it perfectly. You, 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 I think, hopefully, it, it was something that I'm sure would have been stressful at many moments. But uh, now you've seen the, the, I guess, the return of impression that yeah. people have just found it so amazing. I hope yeah. you, you do many more. <laughs> yeah, no, I think my favorite thing, honestly, you know, it was an idea I had that, you know, my <laughs> my team is always like, I'll come in, I'm like, oh, I have an idea. And they're like, the eye roll, like, oh, my God, another idea. But I had this idea um, to have a grant program because we were talking about the future of beauty. <sighs> and I just felt like, how can we be talking about the future of beauty if the potential future of beauty can't afford to come to the event? Um, and Lou Brizal helped us sponsor it. And we, so we brought eight pure startups so they could have no venture funding. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them were very, very early stage. Um, and then I decided that's not enough. We gave away another 16 tickets. Um, and then I decided this is a case where everyone should win. So then we gave everyone memberships as well. Um, yeah. And the value those people got out of the, the day was so humbling to me. And, you know, it um, it's something that I think that we'll always do moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we are in the event business. So we um, – and, and I will say, you know, I didn't talk about the content, but the content always comes first for yeah. us. Um, you know, it's very intentional how we put it together. Um, you know, our revenue model does not include people paying to speak, so you cannot buy your way on one of our panels. Not to say our sponsors aren't aren't um, involved, because yeah. if they bring value to a conversation, of and course we want them. Um, yeah. But that is sort of... Um, a line we've drawn in the sand. So, um, yeah, we have three events planned, New York in April, yeah. and then we'll, we're planning another London event, and then we'll do yeah. L.A. again in the fall. We just did a London one, which was amazing. And again, to my more collaboration, less competition, you did a you know great event recently with British Beauty Council, which was amazing, and I got to thank you for inviting me to speak there as well. And uh, it was so fun, uh, such a beautiful location. And again... You did it again, just brought 
a really, I think, a really good group of people together uh, with interesting conversations, but also in a very comforting, uh, very inviting uh, atmosphere. I think that's what you're really good at. But I think that's well, you also, as well, it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also about curating the audience. Yeah. So, true, um, true. You, yeah, with each of our events, we sort of have an activation point. So we know we're going to get. Um, we know we sort of start from that point and then build build the audience from there. But and it's and it's also important to us that it's representative of the entire beauty industry. So. And I want to ask about your podcast because as a podcast yeah. side host, and I think you know we, you have many hats as well. So it's a, it's a side. <laughs> you, you're not just a pure podcast host. You have many other things you're doing. But how is it like? Uh, like you become the beneficiary, right? Hearing people's stories. Like just, yeah. I would love to know what your point of view being a podcast host. You know, I always. I think it's because I. I don't love being on camera, but I love talking to people and I yeah. love learning from people. I love, I love having conversations with smart people. Um, and so I, I was dabbling kind of with um, mouth media and some of the podcasts that they host. So I would do hosts. I would host some of their podcasts. And um, I really liked the medium. Um mm. And I think, you know, in terms of the kind of conversations we have, they're very different than our webinars or how we write. Um, they're much more intimate conversations, I think. And I, I don't know. I, um, I think I'm a better talker than a writer. Maybe not the most elegant talker, but I like talking is easier. Um, and so I love those conversations, especially when people show up and they're really – just willing to have an unscripted conversation. Definitely, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's, it's, it's kind of what I do it too. And I think it's just nice to make new friends as well as a yeah. podcast host because um, you really do connect and bond with someone in a 30 to one hour, you know, 30 minutes, one hour conversation. It's, it's really amazing what podcasts can do. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of want to ask a little bit before we go to fire round questions about the future of Beauty Matter. I know, I don't know if, I mean, like how you started, I don't know if it's just, you see where it goes and uh, let the let the cause run its ship, or do you have like a sort of like few updates next year apart from the events which you talk about? Yeah, no, we have um, you know that 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 four page PowerPoint has turned into a proper business plan and business model, yeah. and rightly so, um, rightly so, yeah, yeah. So we have listen. Our our plan is to make this as big as we can. Um, you know, we want to continue to sort of push to have a global perspective. So we'll, yeah. we'll, we're actively expanding the editorial team. Um, you know, we've just we're, we've just brought on you know six new interns, two new hires. So we're building out the team. So while we don't have inventory to build, this is a very sort of human resource intense um, business. So we're building out our team, um, and you know we will. Um, you know, for, in the first time, I've always self-funded into oblivion my startups. Mm -hmm. I decided we're not going to do that to this one. I've been very, you know, the three years that I sort of let it build, I was very, very, very careful to not screw it up in the process, knowing yeah. that one day, um, you know, we would turn this into something big. And so, yeah, we're going to go out and try and raise money in a really horrible environment to raise oh money. Oh, my God. Um, but, but you've got to, something very different and very compelling. And I think, yeah. that, you know, you stand out the, the traditional things that are trying to raise money right now, which it is hard for them. I think you guys are doing something very different. Yeah. Well, you know, people were trying to push us to do it sooner. And I was just like, we have to focus on the business. I don't, we don't have anyone to run it. It's just me and John. If we start raising yeah. money, the wheels are going to fall off this thing. Yeah. Um, exactly. So now's the right time. So once we do yeah. that, then we'll be able to put the gas on. But next year, you know, our strategy has always been each year we launch a revenue stream. Um, yeah. We test it, we learn, and then we refine. So this uh -huh. year we're in a sort of refinement model or in refinement mode um, for all of our business streams. And then we have some big ideas that we want to bet on that require significant technology. So that's kind of where the money comes in. Amazing. So excited. So I, mean, I asked all my guests a uh, kind of uh, desert island situation. I was thinking... 
Uh, how do I exp- how do I do it with you? I was, just now I was thinking about that. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna do this. So I'm inviting you to a founded beauty retreat, but like Succession style. I don't know if you've seen Succession. It's a uh, I'm obsessed with Succession? Succession. Yes, it's an Apple, right? Am I, no, am I, am yeah, I'm on the wrong one. No, it's on HBO. Thinking, no, I'm not thinking about Succession. I'm thinking about what's the oh. one where it's Severance. That's what oh I'm yeah, about. <laughs> that's another right? totally so different. <laughs> Very different. I actually am obsessed with both. I love succession. But severance, um, this is when I don't come up with it. I don't plan in advance. This is what happens. But basically, I'm thinking of a severance situation where you're coming to found a beauty retreat, but you can only bring one memory with you. What is one memory from building Beauty Matter that is something really close to your heart? I honestly have to say... It's, you know, for me, it's usually the most recent thing. It was really yeah. walking into the event yeah. um, in L.A. and sort of seeing the community that we've nurtured for six years mm-hmm. kind of Post-pandemic. in real life. Yeah. And then also seeing sort of how people experienced it on social. Um, and I was really proud for the team because everyone, everyone worked so hard. Um, And I think there were moments where we're like, can we pull this off? Um, And um, and our partner, um, our partner, Black Box, the the creative agency and my my very first business partner who saved us, um, uh, you know, without them, we couldn't have done it. So I was I was really proud of what we had done. But and and of the team and um, and our community for showing up. I was really humbled by that. So. Oh, no. And yeah, Black, are they the ones who created the most incredible award that you guys so kindly gifted me? Were they the ones who did the red one? I don't know. Yeah, so they're the ones who did all of the um, all the video that you saw. And by the yeah. way, all of that video, the video, the photography, it was all stock video. Like, we paid for nothing. It was all royalty-free. Wow. It's amazing. Um, it looks so good. That's yeah, so we were really resourceful, but they did all of like those full full wall graphics. Um, yeah. They picked out all the furniture with us. Um, they made the market happen. Um, they really sort of were the producers of, of the event. They're incredible. Amazing. Oh, so cool. Well, now fire around questions. This is the first thing that comes to your mind. So my first question is, what's a beauty brand that you're currently loving right now? That's so mean because there's a lot of them I'm sure you love but right now what are you loving aside from Fable and Maine aside from Fable and Maine of course <laughs> so that was an obvious answer <laughs> I, I have to say I am um, I'm loving Bubble and I think for me yeah, sometimes it's shy. hard to yeah. separate the product from the founder because I think they're I so tied um, yeah. I am um Shy is very special, a really very smart founder, and what she's building is yeah. exciting. And the products are fantastic too. Exactly. I love Shy. I just had dinner with her recently in New York, and she is a she's so inspiring. But also, what I love about it is she's like the complete polar opposite to the typical beauty founders yeah. that you see, right? So when I have conversations with her, I'm like, oh, like I'm an engineer for four years, right? I'm not really someone that should be traditionally in this industry so it's just really cool to like have conversations with her and I think also yourself as well right it's like it's nice to have that different conversations but also then take those ideas into the beauty industry well well. it's also interesting when everyone you know she's a performance marketer and while the entire industry is all about speed to market how fast can I launch things she's launching products on a two-year development cycle and, and and not with profit in mind. She's really doing it with the community in mind. Right? She builds yeah. it with community, but she also like sacrifices margin to get the best price, which I think yeah. she's 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 doing something very special. And the name yeah. is is pretty awesome. It's very yeah. cool. I love bubble. Uh, I love that one. Um, next question is: What's a guilty pleasure of yours? Oh, a guilty pleasure. Um, honestly, a guilty pleasure is is just like watching. Uh, <laughs> watching British crime shows with my husband who's British just like vegging out and watching like crazy you know those those crime shows that happen you know in the middle of nowhere and every week someone dies and you're like how is it possible there's only 50 people that live in the town no no trust me this is Britain for you I mean growing up that was probably my life like I remember like I'm not I shouldn't laugh about this but I lived in the countryside and the amount of times I would have like once like in my home like um, my mom was up to going upstairs to a room 
opened the door and there was a guy by the bed, like crouching down. I'm not. Oh kidding. my god. With a hoodie on. I mean, these are things that traumatized me growing up. So I was like, couldn't sleep for a lot. Yeah. So I'm saying this very like chilled. But I'm like, this was <laughs> growing up in in the countryside. Okay. So there's some weird stories. So I think we should have an episode with them about what, what happened with us growing up. But yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. Um, but my next question is maybe I'll expose a few of these uh, channels. But like, um, what are you currently watching or reading right now? So um, watching. Um... The Insider, or is it The Insider mm. or The Inside Job? No, The Insider. Insiders, um, yeah, Insider, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, coming up, it will be the World Cup all the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> and reading, you know, I, I used to love to read, but now mm. I find that I read so much. Like, when I go on vacation, I'll always have a book, but, yeah. like... I don't know. I, 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 it, it has become a luxury. So I'm not really reading anything right now other than what I read online. And I I must say, you pretty much read most articles. I mean, in online articles and news, because every day there's so much news in the beauty industry. It is even more, you know, yeah, it is. And then, you know, you get sucked in a rabbit hole and you're reading some sort of something totally random. But when I actually read, like, I can't do it on a screen. It has to be a physical book. Physical. Um, Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I feel you. I feel you. Uh, Do you have like a favorite social media platform right now? It's it's not going to be cool, but um, I am playing with Be Real, and I I I love it because I yeah. I think it's kind of in that like discovery mode, um, and I'm curious to see how it evolves and if it becomes important or if it goes away. But at the end of the day, like LinkedIn is our bread and butter. Um, yeah. And we've really, I've been diving in trying to understand it because it's really a black box, but it's going through some interesting evolutions. Um, So, you know, that's kind of the primary um, social media platform for us. I mean, if I wasn't doing Beauty Matter, honestly, I think I'd be off social media entirely, but it's not an option. <laughs> I know. We have to, unfortunately. This is where we live in for businesses. But, but yeah, I think if you're mindful with our consumption, we can, we can live with it, I think. Um, my next question is, what, do you have, like, a favorite quote or, like, a saying that you keep close to your heart? Um... Oh, my God, I should have prepared. Did you give me these questions before? Should I have prepared no, for this? to be fair, <laughs> it's meant to be, like, last minute. But you know what the funniest thing is, is I, like, if I got asked this question, I'd be like, uh, I have so many, but I don't remember any of them. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. But um, yeah. so I kind of, like, I kind of say, like, do you have, like, something, like, like you know, like, did you say, like, be humble or, or, like, just... No, you know, be, I... I I don't know that – I'm sure it's a quote that I found somewhere, Um, but it's it's this idea of always be looking. Yeah, I like that. That's so cool. Just like always be looking because you – yeah. You never – so it's – I don't know that it's a quote, more of just sort of a way of being. But always be mm. looking because you never know where an idea is going to come from or who you're going to meet. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I guess I kind of tell the team that too. It's like you just always have to be looking. Yeah. You never know till you know. And I think you have to just try yeah. uh, and be curious. Uh, my last question is – if you weren't currently like in the beauty industry as an entrepreneur in the beauty space, what would Kelly be doing right now? Hmm. You know, I, I feel like, um, I feel like I would, and maybe I still, I will on the other side of this, um, do something in sort of the nonprofit um, yeah. world. But I think I, I think less nonprofit and more sort of social entrepreneurship. An impact. Um, yeah, exactly. So we do a little bit about, well, you know, we have uh, an, an impact um, initiative. We've decided our impact initiative actually is to amplify the work of others. Um, oh, we have a platform that. and they're doing the work. So um, that's what we do. But um, I think... Yeah, I I would be doing something sort of in in the realm of more having a more of a direct impact against a cause. 
I love that. Um, it would have been totally, well, at different stages of my life, it would have been totally different answers, but that's where I'm at now. <laughs> I know. That's why I always say, like, I always like that to be a lingering question we always ask ourselves because it's, you know, um, well, Gen Zs will, you know, they now say J1, J2. I mean, they're doing J3, J4. They have 100 things yeah. they're doing, right? But generally speaking, I think it's always good to think about, you know, sometimes we're in it, we love it, we can't see anything out of it. But if I was, like, I was, who was I? I was with, like, Inga from Face Gym the other day, and she was like, if I was, I'm gonna, if I wasn't doing this, and I'm, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have a goat farm. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, do it. Like, you know, you never know where you, what you could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that, um, yeah. I think that's what I would I would take my knowledge and then maybe do sort of a social like I don't I don't know that okay. I'd ever build another brand um yeah. but I might build a brand um yeah. to fund a cause that I believed in that I could see myself that, doing. That that's exactly what I'm doing with Fable. My exit will be um predominantly going to my fund which is to help wildlife conservation because you need money to do good. Trust me, exactly. like we all know. <laughs> so, and so I need to think about revenue, but then I think my drive is also thinking about it for others, not just for my pocket, which gives yeah. me more of a purpose because after a while I'll be like, okay, well, how much is, you know, where do you stop? But then if I think there's a bigger cause in the way which I'm helping, I think that's my driving beacon. So I think most people should strive to have that as a form of their return of impact, right? With their time in the business is how can we yeah. build bigger causes? So you're doing that with Beauty Matter anyway. So it's kind of like a two in one question, but yeah, it's very, very cool. But Kelly, it's been such a pleasure as always speaking to you. We could speak all day, but um, I, know. I, I know we have businesses to run, so I'll let <laughs> you free. But before you go, where can everyone find yourself and Beauty Matter, all the links, let us know. Yeah, so um, it's beautymatter.com. Um, and on most social channels, it is Beauty Matter. On Instagram, it's Beauty Matter Official. Um, yeah. And our podcast is called It's a Matter of, which Akash, we're film, we're film, I say filming, we're recording our next season in March. So you have to be the first I'm guest. <laughs> coming on without I, I was All I right. was, was going to ask you but I was like let me I, I was like I'm going to demand it so now you've asked me I'm like yes I'm no <laughs> yes I I have my I'm building out my list now um, yeah, and yeah. so yes it's it's uh, it's a matter of and it is on you know on all the obvious podcast channels it's one of my favorite guys. And I'll, I'll, I'll put all the links, including Kelly's Instagram and um, socials and, and in the summary. So people can just go tip, click straight away. And Thank please you. do subscribe to It's a Matter Of if you're subscribing to this. Uh, so you can have your two beauty podcast <laughs> destinations. And, um, and I'm sure you'll have different learnings in both. So please do. And Kelly, I'll see you very, very soon, either in the yes. States or here. And just more stuff we'll be doing together. This is just the beginning. All right. Yeah, I'm excited. Year, it's been friendship. such so nice to get to know you and yeah we're just getting started with our collaborations watch out <laughs> watch out everyone watch out <laughs>